I must now move to questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. I call, call Mr. Jerry Kelly. In Going for Growth, the Agri-Food Strategy Board recommended the creation of an agri-food marketing organisation with a clear food promotion strategy. Following this, my colleague, the First Minister, in her former role as Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment, commissioned a review of agri-food marketing arrangements in Northern Ireland and endorsed the review's conclusion that an agri-food marketing body be established to coordinate the marketing of our food and drink produce based on the model of Scotland Food and Drink. Work in this project is being led by the Department for the Economy. However, I share my colleague Economy Minister Simon Hamilton's view that the marketing body should be established as soon as practically possible. Local farmers and fishermen need to be confident that there are sustainable markets in which to sell their produce. Any strategic growth in the agri-food sector will be export-led and a strategic coordinated approach to marketing through a single organisation is key to delivering this growth. My officials are supporting their DFE counterparts and industry representatives in developing an agreed model which will allow the executive to provide suitable government support to the new body and will satisfy the requirements of the industry and also of government. Mr Kelly for a supplementary. I go on, I thank the Minister. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that the result of the EU uh, referendum is going to make the job of any marketing organisation a much more difficult one? Okay, and I thank the, the member for his question. The need for a marketing organisation was established long before Brexit. Um, I do feel that Brexit reinforces the need for this body. Um, there, we need a, a marketing body for Northern Ireland produce and we need to ensure that our product goes to appropriate markets um, and we also need to, we need to ensure, ensure that our, mar our markets are open um, right across the United Kingdom. We also retain existing markets but we also have the opportunities to go to, to new markets and a marketing or organisation allows us to do that. Um, I believe that it needs to be set up as, as quickly as possible and I'm working along with um, colleagues in economy in order to do so. Oh, Mr. Robin Swan. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her last commitment there that she'll work as quick as possible. Can she give us some indication then when it will actually happen? Because at this minute in time, without this body in place, we are missing opportunities. Um, I thank the, the member for his question, and, and I do appreciate that. And I have met with the, um, the Agri Food Strategy Board in relation to this. Um, there are obviously some issues in relation to how, what that model looks like and how it will be presented. I believe that there is an opportunity to, to bring all the groups that we currently have together with an umbrella organisation and to move through that um, quite quickly. Um, they are obviously, because the Agri-Food Strategy Board have been working on this for some time, they perhaps see a different model, um, but I do think there is an urgency in relation to, to setting this up quickly. Well, Mr Mervyn Stewart. Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister for her answers uh, thus far. I can also thank her for visiting my constituents at the weekend in relation to the agri-food industry uh, by attending the Nor Northern Ireland Potato Festival at the Giants Causeway, a world-class venue to celebrate the humble spud. Uh, could I ask the Minister uh, to give the House an update in relation to the agri-food uh, processing investment grant scheme uh, and how that will be processed in the future? Uh, thank you, and I thank the, the member for his question. And, and, and obviously, I, had a, I actually had a very good day in, in the Northwest. I was also at Limavadi for the, um, the ploughing championships. Um, the Agri-Food um, Processing Investment Grant Scheme has a proposed budget of £27.5 million. Pounds, and the purpose of this is really just to improve the economic performance and the competitiveness of the agri-food sector. And this will be through capital investment in processing, marketing, and or the development of agricultural products. Again, we're working with the economy department and also with Invest NI to explore the scope and feasibility of a single streamlined offering to support the food sector. What I want to do is to make sure that what we do deliver um, is a scheme that best fits the needs of the local agri-food processing sector. 
Um, let me clear, we will be taking these decisions as quickly as possible and we will start to implement the scheme as soon as possible. Well, Ms. Claire Hanna. Thank, the, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. As she indicates, the, the need for the joint body has been established for some time, and I believe it was greenlit for some time. Can you outline the reasons why it hasn't happened to date, and is there anything we should know? I thank the, the member for her question, and, and obviously um, I've, only, I've been in post since May. I'm unclear as to what the processes were before that and what engagement there was with the previous minister along with, um, with Daddy colleagues. Um, all I can say is I've given a commitment to this. I do see there is a purpose to it, um, and I think that we should be getting, getting behind them in order to deliver on it as quickly as possible. I have to inform the members that question number two has been withdrawn within the time limits. Call Mr. John O'Dowd. Question number three. I am acutely aware of the devastating effects that coastal erosion can have on people's lives. It's one of the reasons which I established a coastal forum when I was the Minister for Regional Development. I could also see that we needed to deal with coastal management in a much more strategic way, particularly in relation to coastal erosion. Now that I'm the DARA Minister, my responsibilities have, of course, changed. My department is responsible for marine licensing and nature conservation protection, but I'm still very keen to be involved. I've met with Chris um, Hazard, Minister for Infrastructure, and we've agreed to co-chair meetings of the forum. The forum has already identified the key issues that need to be tackled. These include the completion of a robust scientific evidence base on coastal processes in Northern Ireland and allocation of the coastal erosion risk management function. And I'm confident that the forum will help to deliver on those issues. I should say that coastal erosion is a natural process, so it's going to continue. The challenge we face is to find the best way of managing coastal change, both erosion and flooding. It's about having a clear vision of how we want Northern Ireland's coastline to be shaped now and into the future. And I can assure members that I will continue to play my part wherever possible. So, Dowd, first supplementary. Uh, I want to thank the Minister for her response and acknowledge the, the good work that the Forum carried out in the past. And uh, welcome the fact that the Minister intends to continue the forum going into the future. So, the minister, my supplementary was going to be the confirmation that the forum would go into the future, and the Minister has already answered it, so thank you. I thank him, obviously, the, the, the member for his comments, but uh, I do plan to have a good working relationship along with DFI with regards to that. In the past, when I was in, in regional development, I had a, a good working relationship with the former DOE minister and also um, the former DARD minister um, for, allowed um, a representative from her department to come forward, um, and David, Port, David Porter worked very well in that group. So that, that establishing that was, was useful. Uh, and I hope to see it working forward, actually, to, to make, have a meaningful outcome. Mr. Colin McGrath. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her work in this area. But could I ask, has an assessment been undertaken at all uh, to date to determine how many properties and how much land is actually affected by coastal erosion? Uh, thank the, the member for his, his question. And that's actually one of the issues that we, we currently have, and that's the lack of data. Um, and that's certainly one of the things which we need to look at while we're doing our scoping exercise, around, particularly around the terms of reference, um, and how we then move forward in order to, to achieve that, because there are various groups who are collating their own information. Um, we have a lot of information being, um, a lot of science work and research being carried out by universities. We have also now individual councils who are carrying out work. Um, DFI have, are doing their own work, particularly around sort of the structural infrastructure side of things. And it's about bringing that together so that we have a full view of the impact and the potential impact that this will have as we, as we go forward. Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. The Minister will be aware of coastal erosion around parts of North uh, and Coast, particularly Coltra, Craig Avad and the Kinniger areas of Hollywood. Uh, Recognising that, does she again see the need for coordination between the various agencies and clear definitions on, on responsibility, particularly with the Department of Infrastructure, DERA, her department and the local council? I thank the member for his, his question, absolutely. And, and when I was in my previous role, I'd obviously met the member with regards to the issues at Kinniger. But he will also be aware that um, coastal flooding is the responsibility of the Department of, for Infrastructure. 
Um, Kenegar has been identified as at risk of flooding during extreme tidal events and is included in the coastal flood response plan. So it is important that um, various agencies do work together um, and are at, at, at a place where they can react very quickly to, to flooding, particularly in areas such as Kenegar. Mr. Mike Nasbitt. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Could I invite the Minister to join me in applauding uh, the work of the Arch Peninsula Coastal Erosion Group? Uh, and perhaps could she update us uh, on whether they are likely to secure two of their key objectives, namely uh, a fit for purpose policy to replace uh, the discredited Bateman formula, uh, and secondly, securing a lead executive department for coastal management issues? Thank you, and, and I thank the member for his. Um, his question as a, as a fellow member of that group and who have attended obviously in a number of meetings and I absolutely want to congratulate the work of Eric Rainey, Sandra Henderson and, and others involved in that and they really have brought this to the attention of this house um, and really on the back of that I'm, I was absolutely delighted then that I could then move that forward and that group were then represented on the very initial meeting that I had of the Coastal Forum and I really do want to use the template which they have established with regards to community action um, I, I've spoken to other members in this house from other constituencies and I do think that it's very important that we do get that from a grassroots perspective as well because they are our eyes and ears along the, along the, coastal, um, along the coastline. With regards to, to Bateman um, and also a lead department, um, you'll understand that part of the terms of reference which we are establishing for the forum will address those concerns. Um, I'm not clear whether or not we actually need a lead department at this stage because I do think that um, working in partnership with DFI and my own department, that may in itself be adequate. But again, that's something that we can explore as we're going down. Obviously, by doing that, we've, we've reduced the number of departments who are, who are naturally going to be involved anyway. Um, but I think that's something that we can explore. And I think we're on a positive pathway to that. Well, Ms. Kelly Arms. Thank you very much, um, Principal Speaker. Um, thank you very much, Minister, for your um, information today about coastal erosion. Can I just ask, when the scoping exercise is being carried out, um, obviously there will be considerations to a budget going forward. Will rural proofing be brought in so that those people who had a million pounds worth of damage, those small number of businesses along the coast, can finally be included um, in some of the payments? Um, I, thank, I thank the member for a question, and I'm again a, a fellow member of that group and constituency colleague. Um, with regards to scoping, again, uh, this is something we're going to have to look at as we move forward. I'm the minister who's responsible for the Rural Needs Act, um, so again, rural proofing will be part of that. Um, it's still very early days with regards to what that's going to look like, um, particularly around what funding will be required for coastal erosion. Um, some of that may then fall in with um, the Department of Infrastructure, particularly around the coastal flooding aspect of things, but again, that's something that we'll need to look at. Call Mr. Harold McKay. Our question number four, please. I am fully aware of the impact the recent poor weather has had on farms across Northern Ireland, but particularly in the north and west of the province. Unsettled weather during the summer months has resulted in difficult conditions for silage making, slurry spreading and the harvesting of arable crops. In localised areas, cattle have been housed earlier than usual, which means that feed and forage are already being used as at an additional cost to the farmer and the harvesting of spring cereal crops has not yet been completed. Also, much um, straw has still to be baled, and progress with the potato harvest and the sowing of winter cereals has been slow. All these issues combined to have an adverse impact on cash flows on farms. In June, as the member will be aware, I announced my commitment to pay at least 95% of eligible basic payment scheme applicants in December, and I also confirm that I will introduce advance payments this year from the 16th of October. This will undoubtedly help farmers meet financial challenges that arise as a result of the recent poor weather. In addition to this, CAFRI advisors are available at business development group meetings to discuss with farmers and growers how their business might respond to the impact of poor weather conditions. CAFRI will also deliver feed efficiency and business management workshops in the areas worst affected by poor weather conditions during the autumn and winter. Further guidance is available on the DARA website, 
which will help farmers plan for a good supply of fodder for the winter months ahead and make the best decisions for their farm businesses. Well, Mr McKee, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers this far. The problem has only been exacerbated by further bad weather over the last fortnight. In addition to a likely shortage of second cut further becoming a serious problem, there is increasing pressure of slurry tanks not being emptied. Will the Minister now agree to extend the slurry spreading period in order to allow farmers to have their tanks emptied in an environmentally safe way? Okay, I, th I thank the member for his question, and, and I am aware that a number of calls have been made um, for farmers to be granted a dispensation in relation to spreading slurry during the close period. And this does come into force on midnight on Saturday, the 15th of October. There is no legal provision in the Nitrates Action Programme regulations Northern Ireland 2014 to grant a complete waiver. I want to be clear that under exceptional circumstances, beyond the control of, of and not foreseeable by an individual farmer, a defence may be made for non-compliance with some of the requirements of the NAP regulations, including spreading organic manures during the closed period. I believe that the challenges faced by some farmers over recent months as a result of high rainfall and the severe weather conditions in 2015 have been exceptional. Therefore, where a farmer has reasonable cause to spread after the end of the season, the farmer will be able to spread. Such cases would be considered by NIEA on a case-by-case -base, case basis and must be evidence-based, showing that the farmer had taken all reasonable steps to manage the situation and was left with no alternative. And I would encourage farmers who are experiencing particular difficulties to speak to either their DERA advisor or to the local farming organisation. Can I remind members wishing to ask a question that they need to continually rise in their seats? Call Mr. Richie McPhillip. Thank the Minister for answer so far. Coming from Fermanagh, I think we, we get our fair share of wet weather, and there are some farmers in our constituency still have to harvest their grass. I'd just like to ask the Minister what, uh, to outline what recent discussions she has had with representatives of the farming sector on measures to minimise the impact on the farmers. In, in terms of these poor weather conditions? I thank the, the member for his question. And, and obviously, in relation to the question I previously, previously asked, answered, um, I have had conversations with regard to how we can assist um, farmers moving forward. I've met with the, um, the Ulster Farmers Union. I meet with them on a regular basis. And I, I plan to go to Fermanagh um, later this week um, to speak to um, the local groups from the Ulster Farmers Union. Um, so those discussions will be ongoing, um, and obviously, while weather has been starting to improve, that doesn't necessarily mitigate against all the, the concerns that they have. Um, but um, certainly, I'll be in a better place after Thursday. Thank you, well, Mr. Keith Buchanan. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to, like to uh, thank the Minister for answers so far, and indeed uh, commend her on giving some help to the local farmers. Uh, unfortunately, it's not only uh, from Monat rains; it also rains in Tyrone as well. So. Just one additional point. Uh, is it possible for landowners who have surplus grass to allow all our farmers to graze this land over the next coming weeks? Um, for direct payments and ANC, farmers need to be able to demonstrate that they are actively farming all the land that they've claimed. Um, and this can be done by demonstrating that they have the decision-making power and benefits and financial risks for the majority of the agricultural activity carried out on the land. Where the farmer has carried out substantial amounts of agriculture activity on the land during 2016, permitting someone else to graze um, the land for 68 weeks is unlikely to undermine their ability um, to meet the requirement. This may uh, not be the case of a farmer with surplus grass has carried out little or no agricultural activity on his land in 2016. And I would obviously recommend that um, any agreements are documented so that the farmers then can um, provide the necessary evidence just to ensure that they are demonstrating the agricultural activity they have carried out on the land um, during the year. Call the Lord Morrow. Question number five. The member may recall from his previous role in the Environment Committee that there was a commitment to place further restrictions on the use of snares. This commitment was to be achieved through the snares order, which was subject to affirmative resolution. 
The order was laid in October 2015. However, the Assembly's approval was not sought during the previous mandate to bring the legislation into force. I intend to complete the legislative process, which will require a revised order due to the timescale involved since the previous order was laid and the subsequent new Assembly structure. This approach will ensure complete transparency in the process. I'm conscious that many organisations and individuals see the use of snares as being inhumane in the treatment of wild animals. Indeed, some would like to see them banned altogether. However, there is a need to protect farm animals, game birds and other species from predators such as foxes at certain times of the year. The use of snares provides an effective and practical means of providing that protection. I feel that the additional safeguards in the snares order should help negate the concerns of those opposed to the use of snares as the additional restrictions are intended to reduce the level of suffering to animals. Call the Lord Morrow for a supplementary. Well, can I thank the Minister for her answer? Uh, I detected from her answer that this matter has been lying dormant with previous ministers who seem to refuse to do anything about it, which I think is regrettable. It would be good to hear why they did that. But, Minister, could you outline to the Assembly today, if you do not complete this legislation, what is the position? No, no, thank, I thank the, the member for his question. And, and obviously, if the order is not actioned, then we will have the status quo um, and we will have the current level of protection will remain, which are beneficial, but they're limited. For example, the requirement to inspect snares, which are set once every 24 hours. But I feel that the additional restrictions which this order would bring, um, such as that snares must be fitted with permanent safety stops, is required. The purpose of a stop is to prevent the noose closing too far and inflicting damage to the caught animal, particularly by strangulation. I imagine this and other restrictions would be welcomed by both responsible landowners and those who see snaring as an indiscriminate means of pest control, but I don't find the status quo as being acceptable. Well, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, a snare is a, a loop of wire that tightens around the leg, body or neck of any animal that is caught by it. That can include foxes, hares, badgers, deer and at times pets, cats and dogs. Polls have found that around three out of four people in Northern Ireland support a total ban on snares. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, why she is not minded to introduce a total ban? And I thank the, the member for his question. And personally, I have sympathy for the calls um, to ban the use of snares outright. However, as mentioned um, earlier, there is a need to have a practical approach to land management. Young lambs are susceptible to fox predation, as are game birds and other species. And I believe that farmers and gamekeepers require a practical and effective means of vermin control. The alternatives aren't viable. The use of poison is potentially prohibited and would be less targeted as snares and be more inhumane in its approach. It's not reasonable to ask for landowners to patrol their fields with shotguns at night when foxes are most active. And it would also be costly and potentially dangerous to allow others to do this work on their behalf on a large scale. As you'll be aware, a complete ban was discussed during the debate on the Wildlife and Natural Environment Bill, which went through the Assembly in 2011. It was debated at length and it was rejected. And I do feel that the the new legal requirements will help promote best possible practice in the use of snares, but I do have sympathy for the members' comments. Well, Ms. Sinead Brad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number six, please. A full assessment will depend on new arrangements that will be put in place and on how well we can exploit the opportunities that leaving the European Union will present. Since the referendum in June, we have seen a positive impact on the Northern Ireland agri-food sector. There has been a significant depreciation in the value of sterling compared with both the euro and dollar, and this continues to be beneficial to exporting companies. Devaluation of sterling has had a positive impact on the value of basic farm payments to farmers. And as I announced last Friday, the total value of 2016 basic payment scheme and greening payments is 16.5% greater than in 2015. 
resulting in a boost to the total net value of 2016 direct payments to local farmers of £39 million pounds compared to 2015. As I said during questions two weeks ago, most farm gate prices have also improved, partly as a result of exchange rate movements. This is encouraging, and so we can say that the early impact of the vote to leave has been positive for agriculture. The longer term impacts remain obviously to be seen, but I intend to do all that I can to protect and promote the interests of Northern Ireland agri-food sector in the forthcoming negotiations. I intend to be closely and directly involved in the domestic, agricultural, environmental, fisheries and trade policy agendas as they unfold in order to maximise the opportunities that we will, um, we will have from leaving the European Union. Well, Ms Bradley for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. While I applaud your optimism, and I don't fully share in all of it, I would ask the Minister, is it now time for us to have a more balanced debate? Should we be forced to leave the EU against the will of the people of Northern Ireland? Is it not realistic that we start to look at the risks and the threats that exist, particularly to those people working in the agri-food sector? I'd like to thank the member for her question. Um, and um, if she missed it, the UK actually voted to leave. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I don't want to refer to her in maybe the same way the, the First Minister referred to Ramoners, and I hope that she isn't falling into um, that category. Um, but there are conversations which need to be held. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about that. And that's why my department is working hard on that. I have established a consultative group um, I meet regularly now with, with um, colleagues in the various jurisdictions, and that work will continue. But we're not going to, to redo the referendum. The referendum result is very clear, and that we will be leaving the European Union. Paul Michelle Gilder. Uh, Corla, has the Minister raised the concerns of the agri-food industry with the British and Irish governments around the issues of exports and workforce? I uh, thank the, the member for her question, and I have. If, uh, the first meeting which I held with the agri-food sector was just a couple of days after the, um, the result was known. Um, those were the issues which were highlighted to me. Um, those are the conversations that, those are the base of the conversations that I've had, um, both with um, Minister Creed in the Irish Republic, and also with, with George Eustace, Andrea Leadsom, David Davis, the, the Secretary of State. Um, and while there is accepted that there are issues in relation to that, those, those conversations will need to continue with, around that. And those, those have been highlighted by myself and also other colleagues who are very aware of those as being issues. Call Mrs. Joanne Dock. Mr Speaker, um, Minister, th following yesterday's announcement by the Prime Minister that we now have a time frame for triggering our Article 50, can the Minister provide an update on a proposed time frame for negotiations on key agri-food support such as a new basic payment scheme and rural development programme? Um, and I thank the, the member for her, um, for her question, but as she indicated, um, that announcement was made yesterday and you know, obviously we're up today. Um, my department has been working over the last number of months with regards to the various um, issues pertaining to my department. Um, that work will continue. To, will continue. Um, what we will be doing over the, the next number of months is having um, other conversations with George Eustace, Andrea Leadsom, David Davies and so on. Um, I've invited um, George Eustace to come to Northern Ireland, which he's planning to do within the next number of weeks. Um, so we're still at a very early stage with regards to a timescale with regards to what the basic payment is going to be looking like. But I can give her my assurance that what we will be doing is looking for the best outcome for Northern Ireland. Mr. Stephen um, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In light of some of the very particular characteristics uh, of the Northern Ireland market, such as the number of businesses that do uh, their activity on a north-south uh, basis, and also the, the scale in our economy relative to other uh, places, can the minister give her, at the House her assessment as to what is the best model for Northern Ireland agri-food in terms of the future trading arrangement? Is it the single market? Is it the uh, Norwegian model? Is it WTO rules, or is it something else? What is her? view on what is the best way forward for the local sector in terms of trading regime? 
thank the, the member for his question. And again, um, those are scenarios which we're looking at, which would be particular then for Northern Ireland, um, also given the issues around our, our land border, which um, is in itself peculiar to the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, I don't want to be in, getting myself in a position where I, where I tie myself to a particular um, scenario at this stage. Um, it is still early days, but happy to share it with the House once it's been scoped out. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. The member listed at question one has withdrawn his name. I therefore, call Mr. Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, could the minister outline the terms of reference and the cost of the review uh, into the carrier bag levy? Thank, thank the member for his question. And, um, as he'll be aware that. We have committed to deliver a statutory review of the carrier bag levy by April 2017. Um, it will be conducted on behalf of my department by um, Business Consultancy Service, which is a division of the Department of Finance. Um, the terms of reference of that uh, review will be either to look, they'll be looking at, at three options, um, maintain existing arrangements, discontinue the existing levy and remove the 5p charge, and finally, increase the levy to 10 pence for all bags with a threshold extended to 40 pence. Um, the member also asked the, the cost of the um, review. It's costing £29,948, which in itself is, is not insignificant. Mr. Stalford, for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could I ask the Minister just what has the impact been in terms of the funding that has been raised by the levy? Uh, in the most important constituency in Northern Ireland, is South Belfast. Um, thank the, the member for his, his question, and obviously it has had an impact right across Northern Ireland. Um, in particular, in previous years, a challenge fund was run by the former Department of the Environment, um, and this was really to look at en enabling schools and community groups to support and deliver small-scale projects, um, just to improve their local environment and also to um, provide environmental education. Uh, there are a number of groups which have, have benefited from um, the fund in the past. The Mornington Community Project, um, they received £8,000 spend. The Greater Village Regeneration Trust, they um, received £7,454. And Windsor Women's Centre um, received £7,998. Um, that was a total of £23,452.83. Um, what I am considering are options um, around uh, launching a challenge fund for this year alongside, so I'm looking at that alongside priorities for exp of, um, expenditure, but um, I, I do find that this was a, a useful project and I know that um, communities and schools um, felt it was of value. Mr. Conor Murphy. Well, I could I ask the, the Minister, in relation to the Brexit Consultative Committee that has been set up between her own department and the Department for the Economy, who are the relevant stakeholders from her side of the arrangement on that committee? Um, okay, thank the, the member for his question. And they were all relevant from, from my side. Um, we, uh, the Agri-Food Strategy Board, the Northern Ireland Grain Trade Association, the Dairy UK Northern Ireland, um, NIMEA, Environment Link, the Ulster Farmers Union, the Northern Ireland Pro produce, Fish produ uh, Producers Organisation, um, the Northern Ireland um, Agricultural Producers Organisation, um, Northern Ireland Food and Drink Association, and I also had David Dobbin represented, who is the EU Agricultural Task Force member, um, and Moy Park was also represented on that committee. Mr Murphy for supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister for her answer and, and uh, undoubtedly there are a lot of people with a lot of experience in that. There is so to be one gap in, in relation to rural uh, groups who obviously are very important in delivering economic and social outcomes on the ground and will uh, be heavily dependent on EU funding for their existence and to, to assist in the good work uh, that they provide on the ground. Could the Minister look to that particular gap in, in provision on this group and see is there an opportunity to fill it with some of the people who will have that experience? And I thank, and I thank the, the member for his, his question. And um, 
I suppose I recognise that there, there is that gap, but this particular group is the Agri Food and Environment um, Consultative Group, and I was very much aware of the fact that rural groups were not on it, but I didn't feel that this particular group was appropriate for them. I have met with um, the rural groups and I have given them my assurance that they will be involved in the conversation, but I think that there's probably a, a more appropriate forum for them to have a conversation with me or, and also with my officials. Um, and it was the same with the environment side. NIEL are the representative, obviously, as an umbrella group for the environment sector. But again, um, I suppose it is weighted towards the agri-food side. And again, I've given them a commitment that their voices won't be lost either and that there will be appropriate um, engagement with myself and my officials around the environmental side as well. So I have considered that, but I just didn't feel that this particular group was probably the best place for them and for their voice to be adequately heard. Well, Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, given that we've just come through Northern Ireland Environment Week, um, can I ask the Minister what discussion she's had with Whitehall about Northern Ireland's role in meeting the objectives of the Paris Agreement, which is due to come into force in 2020? Um, I um, thank the, the, the member for her question, and at this stage, I haven't had any discussions directly, um, but I'm more than content to do that. Ms. Bradshaw for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank you for your answer. Um, can I ask, uh, um, you will be aware that all regional and sub-regional authorities are required under the agreement to scale up efforts to build resilience to the, effort, the effects of climate change. Can you give me any indication of how you um, plan to meet these objectives? Um, thank the, the member for her question. And obviously, Northern Ireland is actually making good progress with regards to reducing um, its climate change with regards to emissions. Um, the latest greenhouse gas um, inventory, which was published in June 16, um, shows a reduction of 17.4% from 1990 levels. And we're also on target um, to meet the, um, the targets set by the previous programme for government with regards to reduction of 35% by, by 2025. She'll also be aware that uh, I, I launched actually the implementation plan to reduce emissions in um, agri-food industry last week. Um, so again, we are trying um, and working towards um, implementation of that. Um, there's also considerable work now being done, particularly around the farming sector. And she, will, um, she might be aware of the sustainable land use strategy, which is being developed by, by John Gilliland and an independent group. And I'm looking forward to receiving that. Um, towards um, within the next um, month to six weeks. I must inform the House that question number five has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Um, I get, uh, can call you. The Minister has spoken in a number of um, uh, questions. The work her de department has been doing around Brexit. Does she have any detail on the potential loss of income to farmers as a result? Uh, I thank the member for his question. At this stage, obviously, the, um, the current situation is, is positive, and, and he'll, he'll note that from my response to um, the question to um, Ms. Bradley um, earlier. Um, exports are, are much more competitive as a result of the euro sterling uh, exchange rate. Um, sheep prices have increased, um, cattle prices have increased, um, as have pig prices over the last year. And you'll also be aware of the basic payment um, increase of 16.5% on last year, accounting for an extra £39 million to the Northern Ireland economy. Mr Lynch, for a supplement. I want to thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, can the Minister then guarantee uh, farmers that they will be better off financially than as a result of Brexit? In, in the short term, they, they are better off. Um, in the long term, there was, there was absolutely no guarantee were we even to remain within the European Union that they were going to be better off. So it's actually very early days, and I can't forecast that. I call Mr Steve Yeager. Okay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Minister. May I ask the Minister if she is aware of any concerns that have been raised by farmers' groups and the Ulster Farmers' Union surrounding the current practices and procedures of the Northern Ireland Environment Agency? Um, I thank the member for his question and obviously there are ongoing discussions with regards to NIEA and um, farmers and you will be aware that the Ulster Farmers Union and NIEA are looking towards uh, an, an MOU 
Um, hopefully, that will, that will, we will work towards that and it will be a positive outcome for everyone. Um, I'm not sure whether the member has a particular in issue in relation to that and a particular example, but I'm happy to discuss it with him. Well, Mr. Reagan, for a supplementary. Thank you very much indeed, Minister, and thank you very much indeed for your reply. I'm delighted there's an MOU going to be signed. However, I'm having some difficulties in South Antrim, and I would wish to facilitate a meeting with the CEO of the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. And I understand there's some issues with the visit being cleared through your office. I would appreciate it if I would be able to facilitate that meeting as quickly as possible. Thank you. And thank the, the member for his question, and I'm, and I'm content to facilitate um, any particular meeting. But I think he also needs to, we, the House probably needs to recognise too that um, much of what NIEA are doing and what they implement are on the basis of European directives. Um, so I think we also we, we need to, we need to be clear in relation to that, and with regard to the flexibility around that as well. <laughs> I must inform the House that question number eight has been withdrawn. I therefore call Mr. Gordon Lyons. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could the Minister provide an update on the uptake of the EU milk production reduction aid for Northern Ireland? Thank the, the member for his question, and yes, I can. RPA has confirmed 611 applications from Northern Ireland. Um, reduction um, production will take place for the period for October to December uh, this year. Um, this equates to 22% of dairy farms in Northern Ireland. Um, the total volume reduction also will then equate to 21.37 million litres. Um, and will be a 4.17% reduction compared to last year. I call Mr. Lyons for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her, her answer? How does this reduction compare uh, to the rest of the United Kingdom and to the Republic of Ireland? This equates to 33% of the total UK applications and 20% of the UK volume of reduction. Um, in England, there were 892 applications. In Wales, 194. In Scotland, 154. Um, the UK submitted the eighth highest number of applications to the EU and the third highest quantity of proposed reduction. Um, this comparison to the Republic of Ireland, where they were the third highest in the number of applications and the fifth highest with regards to quantity. Um, and just to um, inform members that the second tranche, um, the closing date for it, will be the, the 12th of October. So this is a scheme which is ongoing. Mr. Jerry Kelly is not in his place. Time is therefore up. That concludes question time. I invite the House to take its ease while we change the top table.